tutto il cuore voglio cantare con tutto il cuore voglio cantare con tutto il cuore al mio Signore al mio Signore so excited we're excited about your talk today we've prayed for you before coming on John so you are you're ready to go and we will keep you in prayer as you speak as well fantastic i'm going to pray as well in the name of the father okay. the son, the son, the son and, and the holy spirit, spirit. Amen. amen lord jesus christ open our ears to receive your word your transforming word that became flesh that enters into each and every heart mind and soul and configures us to become more like you you jesus christ lord we ask you to transform our minds transform our hearts and transform our souls we ask you to do this as we learn more about the rosary which you have given to us through Mary, your blessed mother, our blessed mother. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And I'd like to begin with the reading from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, verse 34. And Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I have no husband? And the angel said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Now, this talk is on the 10 reasons to pray the, pray the rosary. And I might not go through all of them. I might not have enough time. And I might just start talking about each of them rather than ticking them off as a shopping list. So before I do that, what I want to say is, unless you pick up a rosary and begin to pray it, you will never understand anything that anyone is saying about the rosary. It is not something you read about. It is not something you hear about. It is something you do. You have to pick it up. It is an experience. It's an experience of prayer. It's an experience of the life of Jesus Christ. It's a, an experience of the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's an experience of grace, and it's a transformational experience. It transforms lives. It transforms families. It transforms cities and countries. It transforms the world. That's the message that Our Lady gave to the free children of Fatima. Pray the rosary and the world will be transformed. And that's the message that we give every time we speak about the rosary. You have to pick it up. You have to begin to pray it. And you have to pray it more than once. And then slowly you will see the transformational power of the rosary, the graces that come. Because if your mind's made up that you're having nothing to do with the rosary, then anything I say is not going to make any difference. I've spoken, because I used to be a Protestant, I've spoken to Protestants and they are so convicted that the rosary is something superstitious and that goes completely against Catholic church teaching. There's nothing superstitious about it. We are against superstition. We do not believe in it. We do not promote it. We are certainly against magic in all its forms. And you can read about that in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. So it's simply not true to call it something superstitious or magical it is a devotion it is a devotion that brings us closer to god it is an experience of prayer it deepens our faith and it gives us a sensitivity a heightened sensitivity to the spiritual world it increases your gift of discernment so that you can know what is of god and what is not of god you can know when a person is struggling in their faith or when they're being tested or tempted beyond the control you know when somebody needs prayer when somebody needs help you know this and you're able to do something about it because you pray the rosary it heightens your spiritual sensitivity in fact saint louis de montfort who knew all about the rosary he said that the grace a soul receives in one month of just saying the rosary would take a preacher several years it would take several years to receive that same grace listening to a preacher as it does praying the rosary in just one year. And I can tell you, since becoming a Catholic in almost 20 years, 20 years of praying the rosary, I have never, ever regretted praying the rosary. Never. Not once. I've regretted many things, but I've never regretted praying the rosary. I've never regretted going to mass. I've never regretted going to confession. 
I've never regretted praying the rosary. And so why do I pray the rosary? This is really the beginning of the 10 reasons. And the first and most important reason for me is that it unites me to God. It unites me to God. Saint Lucia of Fatima said, after the Eucharist, the rosary is what unites us most to God because it's all about God. It's all about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And prayer always unites us to God. And it takes about 20 minutes to pray the rosary. And as you're praying the rosary in those 20 minutes, your whole focus is the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So it's all about God. And because it's all about God, I become God-centered. I am no longer self-centered. All of a sudden now, it's taken me out of myself for those 20 minutes. And not only for those 20 minutes, but it continues to do so after I've prayed the rosary you begin to experience those graces long after. And another reason why I pray the rosary is simply because God wants me to. He wants me to be as closely united to him as possible. And so he gave us the rosary through Mary. And Mary wants us also to pray the rosary. So that's why I pray the rosary, because Mary simply wants me to. When Bernadette seen Mary in Lourdes and Bernadette was praying the rosary, it made Our Lady smile. And so I know when I pray the rosary, it makes Mary smile. And I want to make Mary smile. I want to make the mother of God smile. So it takes me out of myself. It makes me become God-centered. And it also makes me a more loving person, especially towards other people. Because we never pray for the rosary for ourselves alone. We also pray for the rosary for other people, for our family, for our friends, those who are struggling, those who are suffering, for our countries, for our nations. We pray the rosary for those who are against God, atheists, those who are lukewarm in the church. We pray the rosary for everybody. It's probably the least selfish thing you could possibly do is pray the rosary. It's totally selfless. It's not about you. It's about God. It's about Jesus. It's about Mary and it's about others. And so praying the rosary fulfills the very first commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind and love your neighbor as you love yourself. And there's no better way of doing that than through prayer. And so when we pray the rosary, when I pray the rosary, it's all about seeing the life of Jesus through the eyes of Mary. Who knew Jesus best? Mary, his mother, from the moment he was born, from the moment, in fact, the angel Gabriel announced to Mary that she was about to conceive and bring Jesus into the world. And of course, we see this in the mysteries of the, the rosary, the meditations of the rosary. Every day, there's a different meditation, a different area of Jesus' life to focus on. Mary herself said that she stored up the treasures of the mysteries of Jesus' life. She stored them up in her heart and she pondered on them. And the Hebrew word in the Bible to ponder, hagah, means to meditate on, to repeat, to take interest in. And that's what we're doing with the rosary. We're pondering, we're repeating, we're meditating on, we're taking interest in the life of Jesus with Mary. And we're doing it the way Mary did it. We're doing it through the eyes of Mary, and we're doing it, of course, totally inspired and empowered by the Holy Spirit. It's all about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gives us the grace, leads us, guides us, strengthens us. Prayer is a gift from God, and so the Holy Spirit raises our heart and mind and soul to God as we pray the rosary. Another reason why I pray the rosary is because it's biblical. It is 100% biblical, just like the Mass is biblical. Every word spoken in the Mass, you will find in Scripture. Every word. Every word spoken in the Bible, you will find in Scripture. Every word. From the very beginning, before we even start the Rosary, we say, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You read about that in Matthew 28, when Jesus said, baptize all nations in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then we begin. And we begin with the Apostles' Creed. It is one of the most powerful summaries of our faith. When I was a non-Catholic, I would go to the Protestant church and they would recite the Apostles' Creed every month right before receiving communion. Why? Because they knew that the Apostles' Creed came from the Apostles. And so Protestants can't say, well, the rosary is wrong because you recite the Apostles' Creed. No, because you do as well. And so it's biblical to recite the rosary. What else do we say in the rosary? We say the Lord's Prayer. Of course, that comes out of the heart of Scripture. When Jesus was asked, how do we pray? He said, this is how you pray. 
And he began, our Father who art in heaven. And so that's what we say. When we say the Hail Mary, the first part of the Hail Mary comes from the angel Gabriel. Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with you. That's all we're doing is repeating that. And then, of course, Elizabeth says to Mary, blessed are you amongst women and blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus. And so we repeat that. And then when it comes to Holy Mary, Mother of God, of course, this is where Protestants and Catholics disagree. We say that Mary is the mother of God because Jesus is God. You cannot separate the humanity and the divinity from Jesus. You never have been able to do that. And so, of course, as a Protestant, I would say that Mary is the mother of Jesus in his humanity, not in his divinity. And so I'm separating, but you cannot separate because when Jesus was brought into this world, he was brought into this world fully human, fully divine. Mary is the mother of God does not mean Mary created God. It doesn't mean that. It means that Mary gave the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, human flesh and blood in her womb, and then she birthed him into this world. And Jesus never lost that flesh and blood. He went into the tomb for three days, but when he rose from the dead, he was still fully human, fully divine. And when he ascended into heaven, he was glorified in his humanity. As he ascended into heaven, he takes us with him in his humanity. And so we still say Jesus is fully human and fully divine. In fact, in Mass, we receive the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ in the Eucharist because he's still fully human, fully divine. He never lost it. He glorified it. And so to say Mary is not the mother of Jesus in his divinity, only his humanity, is to separate the two. And that was a heresy back in the 4th century. The 4th century, the council got together, the council of Ephesus, and said, no, Jesus is is both fully human, fully divine, and therefore Mary is the mother of God, the Theotokos. She is the mother of God. They, those same bishops who declared Mary is the mother of God are the same bishops who said, this is the New Testament canon that makes up the 27 books. And so the same books that non-Catholics believe are the inspired way of the God come from the same bishops who said Mary is the mother of God. And so it's biblical. Every single word is biblical, therefore every single word is inspired by the Holy Spirit, because every word in scripture is inspired by the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit inspires, breathes through all the prayers of the rosary. And of course, in the rosary, we also ask Jesus to save us from the fires of hell and lead all souls into heaven. The devil doesn't want that. If anybody thinks for one second the rosary is from the devil, why would the devil be happy with us praying that Jesus will lead so all souls into heaven and save us from the fires of hell? And of course, another powerful prayer that we pray is the eternal rest unto them, O Lord. In fact, I'd like to say that right now for all the souls who have departed, because however many people are watching this, that's how many prayers are going to be praying for those in purgatory right now. So let's just say it with me. Eternal rest grant unto them, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon them. May they and the souls of all the faithful departed through the mercy of God rest in peace. And that's in the rosary, and that's said around the world every single day, thousands of times around the world. So that's powerful. And we also say the St. Michael prayer as well. The St. Michael prayer is a deliverance prayer, asking this angel, this powerful angel, which is mentioned in Scripture, to deliver us from Satan, to defeat Satan, and to cast into hell Satan, cast him out of our homes, out of our lives, cast him into hell. And another reason why we are able to ask Mary to even pray for us is because she's more alive now than she has ever was, just like all the saints. One of the arguments I had as a non-Catholic, you can't ask those who have died to pray for you because they're dead. How can you ask the saints to pray for you? They're dead. How can you ask Mary to pray for you? Well, she's dead. Well, do you think death is the end? Or do you think death is the beginning of eternal life? They're not dead. They exist. They exist. And they're alive in Christ right now, more than they ever were in this life. And because of that, they can pray for us and their powers Prayers are so much more powerful for us. If you read in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 12, verse 26, Jesus says, now about the dead rising, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the account of the burning bush, how God said to him, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. So we worship the God of the living, and those living saints can pray for us. 
especially Mary, the mother of God. Another reason why I pray the rosary, not only is because it unites me to God, not only is it because it is biblical, but also because it makes me holy. I want to be holy. I'm trying. I'm nowhere near as holy as I should be or need to be, but I want it. And it prepares me for that. In last week's reading at Mass, we hear about Jesus describing the kingdom of heaven in terms of a parable. He said the kingdom of heaven is compared to a king who gave a feast for his son's wedding. Everyone invited didn't come. So the servants went into the streets and brought everyone in. But the, one, wrong, the, but the ones with the wrong garment were kicked out. What does that mean? What is this feast? This feast is the mass. The king's son is Jesus Christ. And so Jesus is, is the wedding with us. He is, he is at this feast with us because we are married to him. We are the bride. He is the bridegroom. And so the feast is the mass. And everybody's invited to this, but now everybody comes. So the servants go out and invite everybody in. And then the ones who come in and not wearing the right garment are kicked out. What is the right garment? St. Paul tells us we have to be clothed in Christ. That's the right garment. And praying the rosary helps us to be clothed in, clothed in Christ because it's all about Jesus Christ. And so the more we pray, the more we become like Christ. And so... The rosary helps us to become holy. There's no holiness without Jesus Christ. There's no holiness without the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Rosary conforms us to Christ. It's about the life, death, and resurrection of Christ and the ascension of Jesus into heaven. The rosary also takes me out of myself. It takes me out of myself because as I pray it, I get very uncomfortable. It's not easy to pray the rosary when... What happens as you do it is God's light shines upon all the areas of your life that are weak, sinful, and you would rather not see those areas. And as I pray the rosary, that's what happens. The light is shine on the darkest parts of me and the weakest parts of me. It shines its light on any unforgiveness in me. And of course, that's painful. That's not what we want to watch. I was in Medjugorje a few years ago. And when I was there, this was before I was as close to Mary as I am now. I thought I was until I went there. And Mary spoke to me. She said to me, give me your heart. And of course, for a long time, I thought I had. And so now I'm arguing with her, how do I do it? Because I thought I did. And it occurred to me that looking back, all I ever gave her was my head. Every rosary I had ever said was with my head. Every mass with my head every prayer with my head, my heart was closed and it needed to open. And so I asked her to take it to reach on in. And of course, after that, everything changed. I began to say the rosary with my heart. I began to say it slowly and from the heart with the heart. And not too long after that, about a week later, I was in my bedroom and I was praying the rosary. And as it was, my brother came up and he told me that he was depressed and he was suicidal. He suffered with depression and mental illness for a long time. And I didn't know what to do. And he's not Catholic and never prayed the rosary. And that's the only answer I had. I said, let's pray the rosary. And he said, well, how do you do it? And I taught him how to do it. And we went through it. it. Took an hour to get through, but we were doing it. And that was hard for me to do. It meant my heart had to open because it had been closed for so long for about 15 years before that, since he tried to commit suicide, because I always thought he would do it again. So my heart closed and it was a self-protection thing. My heart closed and the defense mechanisms went up until I started, until Medjugorje, when the heart opened and the defense mechanism started coming down. And then I went, I was in my bedroom and my brother came to me and I said, let's pray the rosary, which was hard because this is something very personal for me to do with somebody else especially whose heart was closed for so long. And as I began, we prayed it. And then uh, about a week later, same thing happened. He came back in my room and praying the rosary. He tells me he's depressed, suicidal. I said, let's pray the rosary. And he said, I can't, it's too painful. I said, okay, then I'll pray it. How about you just listen to the words? And he said, okay. So I started going through the rosary and as I'm going through it, of course, the Holy Spirit is involved and inspired me to ask him for forgiveness 
can you imagine how hard that was? And I did. And I knew that this was the moment to do it. Maybe I would never get this moment again. I don't know. But when God asks you to do something, I never say no. And so I asked him, do you forgive me? And he said, what for? In confusion. And I said, for all the times that I pushed you away and were hard towards you. And he said, yes, like it was nothing. And here's me beating myself up all these years when he didn't have anything against me. And so I continued praying the rosary, as painful as it was. The next thing, he asks me for forgiveness. And that blew my mind. I thought I was the one who was hard towards him. And now he's asking me for forgiveness. And I asked him why. And he started telling me why. And he told me that when we were younger, when we were children, our nan bought us and bought me a little remote control car and it was broke. And he admitted that he's the one who smashed it to pieces. And it was incredible how we were going backwards and forwards, just forgiving each other through this rosary. It was a sheer moment of healing. And so the rosary, it takes me out of myself. It teaches me about unforgiveness. It helps me to um, put other people first. And it also helps us to become mystical. It's mystical because, as I said before, we become God-centered. We are taken out of ourselves. It's easy to lose yourself in God. Sometimes you need to take a few days because the distractions of the world are in your head and you're praying the rosary and all these distractions come and all this noise. And so you just bear with it and you get through it. And then in the end, there will be peace. And then eventually what happens is, especially if... You're doing it in a holy place like Lourdes or Fatima or somewhere where there's less distraction or on retreat. Or even online, you can have the you can have Lourdes live online or in adoration. And when you do that, it's easy for you to lose yourself in God as you're praying it over and over again. You just surrender yourself constantly, surrendering your mind, surrendering your heart, surrendering your will. It all comes down to the will. You're surrendering your will. You're saying, God, take it. Take me into yourself as I do this, Mary. Pray for me for this to happen, allow it to happen. And she does. And it also reveals to me as well, my weaknesses. That's probably one of the most painful things about the rosary. It helps me reveal to me about my own weaknesses that nobody else knows, that I don't even know until God shines his light. And recently, that's exactly what happened. I was praying the rosary. Every day we've been praying the rosary with our prayer group, this Pilgrims of Love prayer group that's putting the conference on. And slowly but surely, God has shown me different things. And one of the most difficult things that he showed me, it was really a question that I, that I had. It was deep within that I didn't know I had it until it became conscious. And I said to God, how do I have compassion on somebody who's being abusive towards me? Because my brother with his mental illness, and he also has addictions and they're very severe. And when he doesn't get what he wants, he's very abusive. And that's painful. And I've seen him abusive towards my mom and dad as well because of it. And yet we're supposed to have compassion on somebody who's sick, which is easy. But how do you have compassion on someone who's abusive as well? Because you also know it's not their fault. They can't help it. They're sick, but then they have free will. And then, you know, it's you almost you're not in control. You don't know how to react. But, you know, the Christian way is always one of compassion and charity. And so this question came right up and I asked God, how do I have compassion on someone who's abusive? And there are millions of people all over the world who have the same question. Their children are abusive. They have addictions or their wife or husband might be an alcoholic and they're constantly getting abuse, but they know that they can't help it. And so the question is, how do I have compassion on someone who's just constantly torturing me every single day? How do I have compassion? And so I was thinking about Jesus and I thought, how did Jesus do it? Because the people who crucified him were certainly abusive, weren't they? And yet Jesus cried out to his father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And I thought, OK, that's easy for me to do. It's easy for me to say, forgive him. He doesn't know what he's doing. But what does that look like practically? What can I practically do besides just saying those words? And again, I was looking at Jesus. What did he practically do? And the only answer that I came to was really what Jesus did not do. As Jesus was being abused by all of his, all these people, Jesus did not react with anger. Had he done so, he would have completely destroyed them. <laughs> he could have done. Had he reacted with anger, he could have wiped every one of them out. But he didn't. And that, for me, was the key. He didn't react with anger. 
And I'm, I went for a walk when I was praying the rosary and I was thinking about all of this and praying about all of this. I was actually by the um, local church. They have a grotto to Our Lady of Lourdes. And that's where all this was coming to me. Don't react with anger. React with compassion. And I thought, that's it. You've got to react with compassion. Don't react with anger. And of course, I went back home. And as soon as I opened the door, my brother said one thing and that was it. I exploded all over him. <laughs> After all that... And I could feel it as I'm reacting with anger. It was so uncontrollable. I could hear myself saying these words, but I couldn't stop myself from saying them. I'm saying, John, stop it. What have you just been taught? What has God told you? And I, I can't help it. And they're just coming out. And then I went up to my room to beat myself up, as you do, you know, good Catholic guilt. But that's when it occurred to me. This is where the, the rosary really comes in now. Because now I know what I need to do. I need to not react with anger. And so every time I pray the rosary, that's my focus. God, help me not to react with anger. Give me that grace. And I know the rosary will give me that grace. But the rosary, in, in knowing this, in learning this through prayer, I also have been set up now. I can plan. I can think ahead. I can wake up and say, right, today, people are going to press my buttons. Satan certainly knows what those buttons are. And he has his instruments. And he knows how to use them. And my buttons are going to be pressed. But I know that... I'm going to react if we re I'm going to react with anger because that's my pattern. That's the way it's been for the last 20 years. And I'm not going to change overnight, but this is a step-by-step -step process where it can change a little bit at a time. And change begins today where I realize this is the way, this is my behavior. So this is what I need to do. Don't put myself in that position. I feel like I'm reacting, get myself out. Or at least speak to somebody else. Maybe if you're living in that situation, you can speak to somebody else and say, you need to pull me away when this happens. Pull me away. And I'm getting better at it because this morning, my brother, he didn't push down on every button. He was punching every button that I had within me and I didn't react with anger. It was hard. But, you know, this is the dying to self that St. Paul talks about. Die to self, allow yourself to be crucified with Christ. And he says, you know, we have to pick up our cross daily. And this is part of it. This is the denial of self. And so I'm getting better at it and slowly. But this is what we need to do. We need to, by not reacting with anger, you're actually, it's not that you're not doing something. You are doing something. You're being compassionate. Walk away. Pull yourself away. Buy yourself a punch bag. You know, go to the gym. Go for a walk. Do something different. Yeah, and of course go to confession that's what i need to do now after the last two weeks okay so another reason why i pray the rosary is because it's a weapon against the devil and it's um, as i was writing this list I actually i knew what i wanted to say in all nine of them but when it came to the devil i said god you need to give me something i don't want to look for it myself i don't want to make it up myself i need you to inspire me what should i say here and now and then as soon as I woke up, I got a text message from friends of mine in Manchester. And one of them is a chaplain, a school chaplain. And without any prompting at all, she just started telling me what she says to the children in school about how when we pray the rosary to our Mary, what she is doing in that moment is she is crushing the head of Satan. Isn't that powerful? It was a sheer answer to prayer. I was like, yes, that's exactly it. Mary crushes the head of Satan in our homes and families every time we pray the rosary. And so, you know, what is the devil in your life right now that needs to be crushed? Maybe it is addiction or sickness or illness, this COVID-19. Maybe it's something, you know, that you, you're not even aware of that needs to be crushed. Um, we'll say the rosary. Maybe it's disbelief. Maybe it's atheism in your own house, in your family. Maybe it's communism in your country. Well, that's what Mary can crush. Pray the rosary. This is what St. Dominic actually said, because Dominic received the rosary from Mary in the year 1214. Uh, this is found in the, the book written by St. Louis de Montfort on the secrets of the rosary. St. Dominic was frustrated in bringing about conversion to very sinful people in 1214. And so Our Lady appeared to him with three angels and said, Dear Dominic, do you know which weapon the Blessed Trinity wants to use to reform the world? And she said, the rosary. It's interesting that it was Our Lady who said the rosary was a weapon. And St. Louis de Montfort said, what better weapon could we use than 
meditation on the life and passion of Jesus Christ. For as St. Peter tells us, it is with this thought that we must arm ourselves in order to defend ourselves against the very same enemies whom he has conquered and who molest us every day, ever since the devil was crushed by the humility and the passion of Jesus Christ, says Cardinal Hughes. He has been practically unable to attack a soul that is armed with meditation on the mysteries of our Lord's life. And if he does trouble such a soul, he is sure to be shamefully defeated. Put on the armor of God so as to be able to resist the attacks of the devil. So arm yourselves with the arms of God, with the holy rosary, and you will crush the devil's head and stand firm in the face of all his temptations. That is why even a pair of rosary beads is so terrible to the devil and why the saints have used them to fetter him and drive him from the bodies of those who were possessed. Such happenings have been recorded more than once. And so the rosary is used by the saints and if it's certainly good enough for them, it's good enough for me. If it's good enough for the children who've seen Our Lady like Bernadette or the children of Fatima, it's good enough for me. If it's good enough for the people who survived the genocide in Our Lady of Cabejo because she used the rosary in a kitchen hidden away with other people praying that rosary every single day and she survived, then it's good enough for me. If it's good enough for St. Padre Pio, he had the stigmata, he had the wounds of Christ, he had the gifts of bilocation and reading souls, and he prayed the rosary constantly. If it's good enough for him, it's good enough for me. If it's good enough for some of the most intellectual people who have ever existed in the church, like St. Thomas Aquinas, it's good enough for me. If it's good enough for someone as holy and somebody who suffered like Pope John Paul II, it's good enough for me. If it's good enough for someone as simple as St. Therese of Lisieux, who is enclosed in a Carmelite monastery, unknown to the world, and yet now known by everybody, it's good enough to me. And so the rosary, this is number seven, by the way, if you keep in check. The rosary helps me to receive grace. It helps me to receive strength. And it helps me to do this sometimes if I'm not even able to pray it out loud sometimes if I'm praying it with other people if they're praying it for me with me if I'm joining in with them I've met many people who have suffered greatly and to watch somebody who is in absolute desperation holding on tightly to the rosary where you can see the whites of their knuckles and you're praying with that kind of pain and intensity it's a beautiful thing it, it really is a beautiful thing it's a powerful thing they're holding on to hope when they're holding on to the rosary they're holding on to God. They're holding on to Jesus Christ because part of the rosary is holding on to the crucifix, Jesus. I remember when my mum died and I asked for a priest to come to the hospital and he was giving her the sacrament of the sick. And afterwards he said to me, do you pray the rosary? I said, yes, but most of the times I keep forgetting to take it with me. And so I use my hands instead. I count the rosary with my fingers and I use that. And he said, no, have the rosary. I said, why? What's the difference between my fingers and the beads? And he said, well, with the beads, you are holding on to the crucifix. That's the difference. You're holding on to Jesus Christ when you have the rosary in your hand. And he was right. That's a big difference, especially when you're suffering and you're holding on to that crucifix. When you feel like you're being crucified, you're holding on to the crucified one who is also resurrected because you know by holding on to that crucified one as you're being crucified with him you too will be resurrected with him that pain is not going to last forever it's temporary it's salvific it's a purification that's what the rosary teaches us when you do the rosary you are being purified as you do it i'm not sure if i've included purification in one of these anyway purification's there and so it helps me to receive grace and strength in fact the other day a couple of weeks ago my brother was really sick he was sick every day for at least a week, vomiting really badly. And I thought it was food poison. And it turned out that he, he just told me the other day that he'd overdosed. And he, he overdosed on different tablets every day because he was trying to kill himself and he meant it. And so you can imagine the grief and the pain. And every day we pray the rosary with our prayer group this month for this conference and because it's October. And so as we're praying the rosary, 
I'm online and I couldn't pray. I, I just caved. I broke down, you know, hearing this. And they carried me. They, gosh, I'm breaking down now talking about it. They carried me as they were praying the rosary. And that made all the difference in the world because I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it out loud, but I could follow with my fingers across the beads. And as they were praying, and I was praying, I, it, I, you can only understand what I'm saying if, you, if you've done this yourself. But as I was praying with the pain, I wasn't avoiding it. I was facing it with Jesus and I was facing it with Mary. You know, the first thing that we the first mystery is Jesus in the baptism and where God said, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. And as soon as that was read, I knew God was saying that about me. And then Eddie said it, confirming it, and I knew it. And what was pleasing for me to God was that I was praying in pain with him. I wasn't turning away from it and looking for distractions or running away from it. I was turning to God. I was praying with God. And I knew my prayers were so much more powerful with pain and suffering. Prayer is always powerful. But when you're praying and suffering, then it's a whole new level of power. It's a whole new level of conversion that's going to be brought out when you offer that to God, when you offer that to Our Lady, when you're saying, I'm offering this for my loved ones or somebody who needs conversion, that's when it takes a whole new level. And so as I'm praying it, as I'm holding the rosary and going through the beads, I just set back, head back, arms relaxed, legs out. And I was, I had no choice. I was in complete surrender because I had no energy to do anything else. All the blocks were down. I had no energy to fight back. I had no energy to to put defences up, and I didn't want to either. It was like, God had used this to break down every wall that was in me, and I knew I needed it, and I was just following along with the, the beads, and it was so powerful. And what's even more powerful is after we prayed the rosary and we said our goodbyes that night, all of a sudden, what I wasn't expecting, different people, different friends, some of them I haven't spoken to in ages, for no reason started to contact me, just texting me, Somebody said, I've just been in adoration for you. She had no idea. And somebody else I hadn't seen in, spoken to in February said, let's do Skype. So now we're talking on Skype and I'm sharing this. And somebody else was telling me that um, he just wanted to check in and see if I was okay. And we ended up texting each other until I fell asleep. It was like God knows how to send the right people at the right time. And so does Our Lady. Our Lady is fully involved. There's no doubt about it. This is all pure grace. How can you not say the rosary? How can you not? You know, the best rosaries I've ever done have done, have been done in suffering, have been done in times of deep loneliness, deep exhaustion, deep pain, tears. They're the, the best time, they're the best rosaries I've ever prayed. And you, you know, when you look at a rosary, especially a rosary of somebody who's passed away, you see something, don't you? You see a story. When you see a rosary that's hanging up a shop. What you see is potential. You know that rosary has got potential. Something somewhere is going to, that rosary is going to change lives. But when you see the rosary of somebody who's passed away, you look at that old worn out rosary. And what you see is a life of prayer, a life of pain, a life of suffering, a life of hope. You see a life of conversion because you know that rosary wasn't just for them. That rosary was being prayed for other people, for family members. That rosary is being well used. You know it, especially if you knew, knew the person as a man of rosary, man of the, the rosary beads. I, I'm thinking about a friend of mine, an Italian man called Giuseppe, who lived in Crew, and one incredible, holy man of God. And I would visit him, and he was known as somebody who walked around town praying the rosary every single day. Imagine, and when he passed away, the church in this funeral was over full. You couldn't get in. And I can't even begin to imagine how precious those rosary beads are to his family. You imagine, you know, and that's the same with, that's the, the whole thing about the rosary. It brings unity. It brings families together. Say it as a family. It will bring families together. It, it unites us 
Catholics all around the world as a family of God, as children of God, especially when we pray together. I've prayed the rosary in Italian in Italy with friends in the south of Italy. I've prayed it in, in Italian and in French when I was in Lourdes. I can't speak French, but I was praying it. Um, I was listening. I was praying it in my language as they were praying theirs. When I was in Medjugorje a few years ago, I'm at the, the Blue Cross praying the rosary. Next thing, I'm surrounded by people from Lebanon. And all of a sudden, they circle me. And they start and they sit next to me. I'm wondering what's going on. And the, the Lebanese woman turned to me and said, would you like to join in with us as we say the rosary? And they began saying the rosary in Arabic. It was beautiful. That's what the rosary does. It unites us as a family. I can go anywhere in the world and make friends instantly. If I find a rosary group or especially places of pilgrimage, that's where you'll find people from many different countries and they'll never push you away if you want to pray the rosary with them, even if it's in their language and you say it quietly in yours. And so the rosary brings unity. Okay, I've got five minutes left. That's good because I'm up to number nine. So this is perfect timing. I've already said holding on to rosary is holding on to hope. And we know this because when our Lady of Lourdes appeared, she appeared holding the rosary and Lourdes is known as a place of suffering. So that tells you something about suffering and praying the rosary. And I've already said when Benedette prayed the rosary in Lourdes, it made Our Lady smile. And so when we pray the rosary, we make Our Lady smile. And when Our Lady appeared in Fatima, she actually prepared the children for her appearing by having them pray the rosary. In fact, I think it was Sister Lucia who said to Our Lady, well, um, our brother or friend, go to heaven. And her response was, yes, but he must pray many rosaries first. And so the rosary is central to hope. It's central to salvation. It's central to conversion. And Mary did say that if we were to pray the rosary every day, one of the things that would happen is Russia would be freed from communism. And of course, Russia was freed from communism when Pope John Paul II did what Our Lady asked. He consecrated Russia to her Immaculate Heart. And when that happened, the Berlin Wall that the Russians built in Germany came stumbling down. And I only found out the other day, the other day that Sister Lucia in her room, in her convent, she had a cross. And on that cross was a set of rosary beads. But the, the beads were not made of what we normally see. The beads were made of pieces of the Berlin Wall. How powerful is that? That says a lot about hope. And when I went to Czestakowa in Poland in the museum, I seen a rosary made out of bread that had been put together by people in the consecration camp in, in Germany, in the consecration camps there, and in Auschwitz, probably Poland. Sorry, I said Germany. And so that says it all when they would rather make a rosary out of bread than eat it as they're starving to death, they would rather make a rosary out of it and they prayed the rosary. And so it gives us hope, it's powerful. And lastly, it purifies me. So purification is in there. I thought I missed that one out. It purifies me, it purifies everybody in my life. It purifies my home, it purifies where I'm sitting, it purifies what I'm doing. That's why you feel when you go to a place where the rosaries prayed, especially in the thousands like Lewis, you feel those prayers, you walk into it, you feel the anointing, the holiness, you know a lot of prayers being said there. You know it when you walked into a church where the rosary, the rosary is said every day, you feel it. And when I started praying the rosary after I became a Catholic, I was very surprised how so many desires left me. All of a sudden, the desire to watch certain movies or TV shows just wasn't there. I started to see the truth in everything. I started to see what was a waste of time. I started to see where holiness really was. I started to see what was the priorities in my life. And I started to realize as well through doing the rosaries that it's the best way to overcome addictions. It's the best way to overcome bad habits. I remember hearing about Father Slavko, I think it was, in Medjugorje and how he was standing next to someone who was addicted to drugs and the person who was addicted to drugs, he said, used a needle, whereas the weapon that the priest said he uses was the rosary. 
And of course, the Janaculo community overcome their addictions through prayer, the power of prayer. And the rosary is always involved when it comes to the healing of addictions and the purification of our bad habits, of our sinful habits. And it's a powerful prayer when you just simply don't have the words. Sometimes you just don't have the words. You're overwhelmed. You don't know what to say to God. You're just out. And so just praying the rosary is an easy way for the Holy Spirit to pray in you. So it's a powerful word. It's what I, one of the ways I look at the rosary as well is just, it's a form of medication. When you go to the doctor, he might prescribe all different kinds of medication for different wounds that you have. Because one kind of medication doesn't usually heal all. So he might say to you, okay, you need this kind of medication or you need that medication, you need that prescription. Um, And so sometimes we go to God and there's lots of different kinds of medication he will give us. He will say, right, okay, you need to go to confession. But sometimes we're blocked from going to confession and the rosary gets us there. It removes those blocks. It's that purification. The grace is that we should be open to receiving, that we're not open to receiving because of our wounds and our sins. The rosary opens those graces up, opens those blocks up, heals those wounds. And I felt that incredibly the last time I prayed the rosary because it was in suffering and pain. I felt the rosary come from a depth in my heart that I'd never known before. Every word, it was as though I was speaking it face to face with Our Lady. It was that powerful. It was that. It was as though she was removing barriers and blocks and obstacles within me it was the most beautiful rosary I've ever paid, prayed and as painful as it was I'm glad it happened I'm glad I went through it and so sometimes our Lord will say okay you need to go to mass more than once this week or you need to go to confession or you need to do this but I guarantee he will also say you need to pray the rosary I've also added another which is number 11 Um, But I've already said that anyway, and that is, it keeps me humble because it means, God, I need you. You can do this. I can't. I don't have the strength. I rely on you. I trust in you. And I depend upon you. And you know what's best for me. So I'm going to do my, this, this day, your way. Amen. Al mio Signore, al mio Signore.